having me. Uh, I always tell Gene, uh, Dr. McClatchy, that uh, I probably enjoy this uh, class more than any other endeavor I, I do during the normal course of, of business. Um, and the reason I think is because I, I honestly feel I'm going to be able to impact your life. Uh, and there's a lot of days that go by that I can't say that, that I'm doing that. So from an enrichment standpoint for myself, I really I, I enjoy this. Um, thank you for the introduction, Gene. Uh, as Gene said, I, and when I hear it, someone else say it, that it graduated from um, it's California State Long Beach, um, I realize the name Beach in your school isn't the best thing for your resume. It just doesn't really enhance uh, your chances of getting a great job. It was a fun, fun time. I have to give that. Uh, I'm going to spend uh, a little over an hour with you today. And I, and I want you to understand the, my objectives. I want you to really understand the interview process uh, from an HR perspective. I want you to understand what is the HR person really looking for? What are they going to talk about when you, the candidate, leave the room? What do we talk about? I want you to understand what we look for. I want you to understand what makes a good interview. Gene talked about this 60 seconds. I want to talk about how important it is to make a very quick and positive first impression. So I'm going to give you perspectives that I don't think uh, many of you have heard before. Uh, it's really an insider's perspective uh, of, of interviewing or even self-presentation. Um, certainly can be used more than, than just the interview process. Uh, and I'm glad to see that many of you are approaching um, that, that day of, of graduation, which, which is kind of a bittersweet day. Uh, many of you may want to milk it for a master's or something because you know, entering the real world is kind of a scary thing in and of itself. But it's a skill that I'm going to talk about today that uh, it's not a one and done, uh, meaning that uh, you're going to interview clearly, and I think many of you are going to be going to the career fair next week, so this might be good timing for you. Um, and you're going to interview several times through your career. This is, uh, even when you're in one company, and if you stay with one company, this is my 25th year at State Farm, I've interviewed countless times with, with State Farm, just with different positions internally, and the same skill sets apply, whether it's an entry-level job at a janitor or if it's I'm interviewing for a, uh, an executive position at State Farm. These skill sets that I'm going to talk about today are applicable at all those levels. Uh, I was talking to Dr. McClatchy before the the class, and uh, I was letting her know that I get contacted periodically by uh, some students here at UNC who, who ask me, can you help me out? And, uh, I really don't like saying no to that, and the reason I'm sharing this story is because I, I kind of come to the realization that these skill sets that I'm going to talk about really do apply regardless of your major. So I know many of you are probably Montford College uh, uh, students, and whether it's finance or marketing or, or some other business-related field, uh, this will certainly apply, but it also applies to nursing. Uh, I just helped a, uh, a young graduate from UNC nursing program uh, who was having difficulty getting picked up. Uh, it was kind of surprising to me that nursing is so competitive right now because historically I always thought that you get that degree and um, you know people are throwing money at you as incentives. But they would, what I discovered was it's very competitive right now. It's a little bit flooded in certain areas, so. We polished up her interviewing, and she was very successful. Now, um, I haven't taken biology for a long time, and the technical questions, um, I didn't need to help her with, and I don't need to help you with it. If some of you ask me a finance question, I most likely couldn't answer it. Um, and I don't want you to be concerned about these super technical questions. You will have that, that's, your, that's why you're here. You have this baseline education. What I'm gonna be talking about is this weird human connection you need to get placed, to get picked up. Um, so we had nursing, I had another, a teacher, um, same thing. This teacher who was from, and I don't know where she got my name, she was uh, flying in Windsor, uh, asked me to meet her. And same, same circumstances, I don't know the nitty gritty of teaching and if you ask me uh, specific testing things, I wouldn't be able to do it. And uh, it, again, didn't make any difference that I didn't know the technical part of the role because I was able to allow her to understand what happens from a human resources perspective or even just a human exchange perspective. She was successful uh, at her next interview. Now, I wish I could say to you, 
uh, I can guarantee you, if you go through this hour and 15 minutes with me, that you're going to get picked up at your next interview. I, I'm not going to go that far. But I will go far enough to say that if you listen and you're coachable, uh, that you will interview better. Uh, you will interview better. Now, uh, let's do it this way. Raise your hand if you uh, enjoy the interview process. Right. Yeah, no one's raising their hand. I don't enjoy the interview process. Uh, I, I don't enjoy being on that uh, nervous end of the table. And I want you to know that because a lot of people that I meet with feel that they're an anomaly. Like, I don't know why, Mark, I get so nervous. I don't know why. Well, yeah, because they're asking about you and they're judging you and it's a stressful time. I'm not going to be able to take that away. I'm going to teach you how to kind of minimize it and put it in perspective. But you're going to be nervous, and you're not going to be like, oh, today I got an interview, I'm so happy. Uh, no, it's going to be a stressful time, and you need to prepare for that. Uh, so I don't want to give you any you know, disillusionment that, oh, this is going to be after this class, uh, for sure you'll get the job, and that you're going to enjoy the interview process. I don't think that's true. Um, I think uh, you will interview better, and I think you will be able to manage, hopefully, uh, your level of stress or nerves that can manifest itself in many ways that can really hinder your ability to, to knock it out of the park. So those are the objectives uh, today. Um, just to give you a little background of, of myself, I have been with State Farm 25 years. That's a long time. I had no intent of staying uh, that long. It's just how, how life works out as opportunity unfolds and uh, you, you kind of roll with it. Um, and of the 25 years, I spent a little over a decade in human resources. And that's really what I'm going to focus on today, although I certainly interview candidates uh, even today. Um, and I certainly assist internal candidates with their self-presentation. Uh, so my skill sets from that perspective, uh, HR have not, have not declined because I still use them with some frequency. Um, but while I was in HR, and I started off, and I like um, telling stories, because I really feel that people learn best through storytelling. So uh, I'll take some rabbit trails as I, as I tell you some stories, but it all have a purpose, I can assure you. I started uh, in California with State Farm, and then went into HR in California, and it required a move into the LA area. I was down south of, of Los Angeles, and when I moved into the LA area, uh, I, I went into the Human, human Resources Department uh, and did a lot of my hiring experience at that time. And it's an odd time because I realized, you know, you probably started four or five years ago here during your progression um, to get your degree, which, by the way, uh, is, from my perspective, still is the best investment you will make in your lifetime. That's an investment that I'm confident will pay dividends for you for your entire lifetime. Um, my son doesn't seem to get that message, but I'm hoping you do. Uh, it is, and I see it daily, where your, your edge with this foundation of information allows you to beat candidates out for positions, constantly. And those without the degree bitch about it all the time. Unfair, they say. Oh, it has nothing to do with the education. Well, it does. It does. What you've done here by getting your education is you've shown your employer a lot of things. You've shown dedication. You've shown discipline. You've shown perseverance towards a very difficult goal. So congratulations. You should be very proud of yourself. If your parents supported you, you should be very grateful uh, for their support. Uh, so, I'm taking me back to Los Angeles, and I'm a recruiter, meaning my job is to find the best candidates I can for the money and package of benefits that we're offering. Uh, and it's, it's late, mid to, to late 90s. Right? And at that time, uh, which is going to be odd for you because the, the economy has been struggling along really since, what, 2008. So for quite some time, we, we really haven't seen that kind of economy that was in, in existence uh, mid to late 90s. And it was this dot-com boom. Uh, you probably heard of it. Uh, and what was occurring, especially in the LA area, was employers were absolutely competing for one another for the good candidates. Um, and, and we always knew that you know, from an HR uh, 
perspective that there's this war for talent, and it's very seasonal. And at the time, it was a war for talent. War meaning um, that it was very competitive. Talent being educated individuals. Now, there's not a war, uh, and I've never seen a war for warm bodies. I've never seen that. Uh, there are enough people um, out there, but there's not enough qualified people when a boom from an employment standpoint exists. Uh, that's meaning you. You would be considered a qualified individual, a talented individual because you've attained the baseline education, the foundational education that makes you very attractive to many employers. Uh, so that's where I am. I'm in the mid to late 90s. I'm in this war for talent. My job as an HR person is to recruit the best individuals I can to my organization. Uh, so I want you to picture this at, at the time, and I think you'll probably see very similar at your career fair next week. Employers have booths, uh, and, and you can put your little logos over the booths, and I, I had one, and at the time it was business dress, meaning we had a suit and a tie on, which was not a big attractor in the LA area, right off the bat. And I had my uh, logo for my organization, and on, on one side I had Google, which no one, I didn't even know what Google was. Um, and then on the other side, I had the FBI. And, and I tell you this because I want you to kind of understand uh, the dilemma I was facing at the time from a recruiting standpoint, uh, which is just hard to fathom in today's terms. So I, Google had dogs uh, you know, at their table because at Google, you could bring dogs to work. And they were cute little puppies, and everyone wanted to pet the puppies and talk to Google. And, and then, of course, on, the, on this side was the sexy FBI, you know, with their badges and their, and their guns. and uh, So I'm wedged in between these two sexy companies. And I literally would have trouble getting people to even talk to me regarding employment. And I had jobs. I had a lot of jobs, professional level jobs. I'm not talking call center, startup. No, I'm talking about very good paying, professional level jobs. And I really struggled getting people to talk to me. Um, now, I, I would predict at some point in the future, and things have certainly turned around, that the war for talent will occur again. And employers will be faced with that similar situation where they need to develop either better packages or uh, rebrand their, their image to attract top talent. Um, we're not there yet, and so you're in this competitive environment, and the employers kind of have the advantage right now. And when employers have the advantage, you're going to be facing competition, stiff competition, meaning you need to, to, to nail that interview, to differentiate yourself. Now, as we progress through this presentation, I'm going to tell you that um, most people don't interview well. Most people don't interview well. And I've interviewed a lot of people at State Farm who graduated from UNC. Um, and they're not alone, but they're also no better than someone from CSU, for example, at the interview process. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement in the interview process for people coming out of college. A lot of room. That's good news for you, uh, because many times your competition from an interview perspective is not fierce. And, and I get it. Uh, and it's kind of rare when I see someone who interviews, and I'm like, wow, that was a very good interview. I just don't see it with great frequency. Okay, so I, I want to give you a little bit more of my background. Again, I'm going to go through some storytelling because I, I, I want it to, to culminate into uh, something that you'll remember. So at about seven years of my uh, human resources progression, I uh, interviewed thousands, um, and I was here in Colorado at the time, and as an organization, we were using the services of a self-improvement coach by the name of Dr. Sam Smiley. Uh, and Dr. Smiley was in great demand by many large companies. Uh, and his CV is incredibly impressive on who he has coached, uh, including Robert De Niro. And he has all these uh, books that he's written. And he's just an incredible person. And they, they came to me. Um, State Farm did and said, Mark, we're spending a lot of money utilizing the services of Dr. Sam Smiley to help our, our upper echelon present themselves either in an interview process or to an audience in the most efficient manner possible. So we're going to have you go down. We 
was in Tucson, and spent a few days with Dr. Smiley, learning his skill sets, his tips, his, uh, his resources, uh, so that you can coach uh, our individuals in the future. And I, uh, I, would, I would be lying to you if I said I was, oh yeah, I can't wait. I, I, I remember at the time I was like, really? No one's gonna be able to tell me how to interview. I, I kinda have that little attitude of please. But I'll go. Um, so I, I, went, I went down to Tucson, and Dr. Smiley had asked me, Mark, when you get into town, give me a call. And I left here late, and you know, got into, I think, Phoenix, drove down to Tucson, so it's probably six o'clock, and I'm checking into my hotel, and I'm calling Dr. Smiley, just to tell him I'm in town, with the full expectation that he'd be like, great, we'll meet tomorrow, and blah, blah, blah. But he did, he said, okay, hey, have you eaten? And I'm like, no, and he's like, well, why don't we meet for dinner? And I was like, ugh. I was exhausted from the day and from traveling, and I uh, really didn't feel like doing that, but I, was, I said, okay, I'll meet you for dinner. And he picked the location, told me how to get there, and it was a very nice restaurant. I'm too cheap to normally pick a restaurant like that, but obviously I, I went, and I didn't know what he looked like. I'd read his CV, I've heard about him, uh, I've, I've talked to people who went through his seminars, uh, but I had no idea what he looked like. I never even bothered to ask. So he just told me to you know, wait in that the lobby reception area of this, of this very nice restaurant and I'll come and get you. And so this man approaches me, I went in the lobby, and um, he, he was a much older gentleman uh, that I was anticipating, much, much older. Uh, and so he introduced himself as Dr. Sam Smiley and ultimately went and got a, a seat in the restaurant. And it was just two seats sitting side by side, and I must say, he's super high energy and smiles, and I was enjoying the hell out of it. And we're probably halfway through our meal, maybe a little more, uh, and he stops and says, Mark, what's our waitress's name? And I, uh, I don't know. And he says, well, I want you to watch this. Uh, so the waitress comes to check on our table, and he looks at her and says, Sarah, can I trouble you for some water? And she's like, oh, absolutely. And she turns around and uh, to get the water. And he asks me, Mark, what did you see? And again, I've had a lot of experience, so I, I wasn't an idiot with human exchange. And I said, well, Dr. Spine, I saw that you used her name. And he didn't know her. She had Sarah name tag, you know, on her. Uh, and I saw you use good eye contact. Um, and I saw you use a nice tone. And he says, yes, 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 it's exactly right. He says, but I want you to watch the rest of the night. And sure enough, when Sarah would come back to check on the table, it was like I wasn't even there. And all her questions, all her attention was driven to Dr. Smiley. And when she checked on her table, is there anything else I can get you? All attention focused on him. And so when she'd do that and, and walk away, Dr. Smiley would say, what did you see? I said, well, it's like I'm not even here. He's like, yes. He goes, I have, and this is a word I want you to remember, a human connection with Sarah now. A human connection. And he did it very quickly by that warm tone, the good eye contact, and using her name. And she feels very comfortable with Dr. Smiley. That was my first lesson uh, of, of, this, of this training that I'm going to impart upon you. In a sense, boy, that's pretty simple. It is. It is pretty simple. His point there was how fast this occurs. How fast a human connection can occur by using these techniques. So we left for the night and he asked me, Mark, come to my house the next morning. And he gave me directions. And he said, meet him at seven. And I'm not a morning person, so I'm already struggling with that aspect of it. And I, I go to his house and it says, beautiful, House and the, you know, the driveway is a 40 mile long type of house. Uh, and I pull up and I ring the doorbell and he answers. And right in his uh, living room area, I can see that he has set up um, a table that's designed for inner two chairs. Uh, and I was like, oh gosh, like yourself, I'm not a fan of being on that side of the table. My anxiousness rises as well. So without any other um, uh, uh, training, he says, okay, Mark, sit down and we're gonna go through this mock interview. 
So I go ahead and I sit down, and he asks me the question that most of you will get in a corporate interview, and says, Mark, why don't you start off by telling me a little bit about yourself? So I did, and this is how I started. I'm Mark Neville. I've been with State Farm for 20 years. I've been in this department, that department, blah, blah, blah. And while I'm going through this introduction, he starts doing this. He starts looking under the table while I'm, while I'm still talking. And, my, except in, and it was just odd, right? And I'm like, what? And he says, stop, Mark, stop. And he says to me, I don't like you. That's kind of hard to hear in, in an interview, right? right? It's just, bam, I don't like you. And I, I, mean, I didn't know how to respond to that. And then he says, I want you to use that tone that you were using with this introduction. Okay. One, two, three, four. He'd be like, do you hear that? He says, what is that? Is that the business, Mark? Because I don't like it, he says. He goes, Mark, of last night, I would have hired you for anything. He goes, he asked me, did you enjoy last night, Mark? And I said, I, I did. I sure did. He goes, so did I. And then he asks me, during this little quick introduction, did you hear what he calls the self-reflective voice? And my best way to illustrate that is it's like a little person on your shoulder that talks to you while you're talking, right? It goes something like this. What the hell is he doing looking under the table? Oh, this isn't going well, right? Am I? You know, that kind of thing. You've all heard it, I'm sure. He says, did you hear that this morning during the mock? And I was like, yeah, I, I totally heard that. He, then he asked me, did you hear it last night during dinner? And I said, no. And his point was, you hear that self-reflective voice, you don't have a human connection. Conversely, if you don't hear the self-reflective voice, many times a good indication that you have that human connection. The beauty is you can push that self-reflective voice away if you're aware of it. You can push it out and, and move back into that human connection. And he was right. Now, at the time, I will admit, I was opposed to many of these things that he was presenting to me. He talks about how important the tonality of your voice is. How important that tone of your voice is to making this human connection. As a percentage, way more than the words you're using. The combination of your tonality, which has great volume in it, in addition to your nonverbals, is significantly higher than your word choice. 80 plus percent. The combination of the two. Nonverbals, tonality of your voice, way more important than your, what you're saying. And I was like, mm, I don't know if I really agree with that, Dr. Smiley. He knew. He knew I was highly experienced, and he knew I combated that and wasn't buying in to his entire uh, spiel. He knew it. Um, and he's a painter, as well as uh, having other talents. And so he took me through his house, and he would cover up a painting, and I would just see the person's eyes. Just see their eyes. And he'd say, Mark, what are they, what's this person thinking? And I'd look at the painting, and I, and I would say, well, I don't know, Dr. Smiley. Like, maybe she, she looks a little down, a little melancholy. Maybe she broke up with her boyfriend type. And he's like, yes, what do you see? And I would say, well, you know, you kind of see it in her eyes. And blah, blah. Well, and then he would move on to the next painting and the next. And through that exercise, I learned that the mouth is the most revealing feature on the face. Now, prior to that, I was always this eyes are the windows to the soul type of uh, mentality that the eyes really dictated it and he clearly knocked that, that mindset out for me. The mouth is by far the most revealing feature of your face. Where the mouth goes the eyes fall. There's no question about it. So what does that mean to you? It means I want you to smile during your interview. Imagine that. I want you to show passion, enthusiasm, excitement for the interview. I want you to maintain outstanding eye contact. I don't see this very often. I 
want you to use this warm, passionate, enthusiastic, excited tone of your voice. I don't want you to do the more, well, uh, and with State Farm. No, that's not what I want. I want this warmth, I want depth, I want excitement. So think about it. I want to go back to what an HR person's job really is from a recruiting standpoint. And I want you to understand how they get rated, how they get measured, how do they get their compensation. What's a quality hire from their perspective? All right, so if I have a department that I'm recruiting for, that's my customer, that department is my customer. And I, my job is to go out um, and recruit top quality candidates that have the skill sets that meet their needs. Okay, that seems easy enough, right? Now you imagine that uh, if I'm a if that's my job as a recruiter, and my customer is that particular department, their evaluation of quality can mean a number of things. They want, obviously, good candidates, one. What's a good candidate? Uh, generally, a good candidate can be defined in many ways. They, one, they have the skill sets to do the job. Secondly, uh, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that person interviews well. Many times, the interview with the HR person is a screening interview. In other words, that person's good, that's the first gauntlet you're gonna pass through and that person's gonna pass them on to that department that most likely will do a second interview. So the quality of that hire, if that HR person keeps pushing junk to that department, that department's gonna be angry quick. And they're gonna say, Mark just keeps passing us junk. I don't think he's even screening these people. So that HR person knows that. He doesn't wanna pass on people who cannot interview well. Because then that's gonna be viewed, even if they have the skills as you're just passing junk, I don't, I don't, I don't have a connection with these people. So he wants this connection, he or she. Uh, he wants this person to be able to have a nice self-presentation, because his quality kind of goes to that. Other means of determining if this person, HR person, is giving quality to the department is how long does this person stay with the organization? So it's some tenure-based. If they're picking the right person, the person who should be and truly is enthusiastic, passionate about the job, that person most likely will stay. If you're picking someone who's simply, I just want a job to get through this next six months, that person may very well leave the organization because this isn't their passion. This isn't where they want to be. This is a stepping stone uh, and, and can really hurt them on the back end from a quality perspective is the tenure uh, is very limited. So we'll track how long you've hired 100 people, HR person. Of those people, how many people are here after six months, one year, two years, et cetera. And we track our quality that way. Makes sense. And it makes sense if you understand how much a company invests in a new hire. How much do we invest in a new hire? And I know what it is at State Farm. For our lowest level, we spend $80,000 a year, 80,000 for that, for that one lowest level we have. Now that's not the person's salary, but what goes into that is their salary, their benefits, uh, the training, the workstation costs, what we call duplication, because they've got to have someone train them, so their salary comes into play. So there's a lot of costs that are hidden. And if I lose that person after that first year that I've invested a lot of money in training and didn't get a lot of return on my investment because they haven't really worked much because we're in training, for a good percentage of that. I didn't do the company a favor. And I didn't do that associate, that person I hired a favor. Because arguably, you know, having less than a year on your resume at a, at a large company isn't that big of a deal. And, you know, and they left because apparently they weren't happy. So I, I didn't do anyone a favor if I had that high, high ratio of, of turnover. Does that make sense to you? I really want you to understand the HR roles. Uh, from an insider's perspective. So, now let's go back to Dr. Smiley's training. He, he asked me, Mark, how long do you think you spend before you make the decision on a candidate? I, I think that's a good question. And at the time I answered, Dr. Smiley, I, you know, my interviews traditionally run about 40 minutes long, so I'm gonna answer 40, 40 minutes. I give him the full amount of time. 
And he says, he goes, Mark, I, I'm going to challenge you with that. When you go back to work and you start interviewing, I really want you to ask yourself and be honest with yourself, when are you making the decision? So I did. I, when I went back to work, um, I was sitting with candidates and I would be asking myself, All right, when am I making the decision? Um, and I want you to know this. I was making the decision within the first couple minutes. And I shocked myself with that. And at the time, I had a lot of HR people working for me who did a lot of the recruiting uh, themselves. And I asked them, tell me when you're making the decision. And every one of them said exactly what I said to Dr. Smythe. Oh, Mark, I give them the whole interview and blah, blah, ask them every question. And I said, okay, but I want you to give them the same words. But do me a favor, be honest with yourself. Over the next uh, course of, of interviews, ask yourself, truly, when are you making the decision? Every one of them came back with, it's in the introduction. I'm making it that fast. Introductions can go anywhere, maybe you know, from a minute to, to five minutes long. Every one of them came back and said they're making that decision of yes, going to hire, or no, I'm not going to hire in the introduction. This was an epiphany to me. I couldn't believe it. I, I just couldn't believe it. So what happens in that introduction? And now we're going to spend a lot of time on that. And you can hopefully you're kind of understand why I'm going to spend a lot of time in this introduction. Because the decision is made so fast, arguably nowhere near five minutes. Matter of fact, when I would go get a candidate from our lobby, I'd introduce myself, shake their hands, and I'd walk back to my office, which was maybe 30 yards. Many times I'd, I was in my head going, I knew it, yes or no, already. Before I even started the interview. It was, it was that fast. And it's just really what Dr. Smiley was talking about. That ability to make this human connection with, a per with this other person. And it's done pretty simply. It's done with that, hi, I'm Mark. And they respond, Mark, I'm Sarah. So nice to meet you. And she's looking at me. And she's smiling. And she's using my name. And I'm like, ooh, I like this person. Now, people at State Farm to this day really don't like it when I say it's about likability. High L factor. They don't like it. It's really a counter to our culture. We have a culture of, of strong education. We really push education, which is not a bad thing. But when it comes to the interview process, one thing you have to realize is you're most likely competing against those who have a similar education. Right? So now you gotta differentiate yourself. And people hire Tiffany who they like. Imagine that. People hire who they like. HR refers on who they like. And that's again, it's counterculture, I can assure you to say that. But I can also guarantee you that's what's that's what's occurring. So I'm gonna back it up. I'm in Dr. Smiles. So we're going in through that mock interview, right? And I'm I'm just getting beat up during because he's sharing, he's stopping me periodically and he's sharing these nuggets with me. Like, what is that? I don't like you. And again, it was foreign to me. Like, what does life have to do with anything? What does life have to do? This is an interview. I'm just here to impress you with my my attainments, my education my lofty goals, my accomplishments. That's what this is about. That's what I thought. And I knew that I was going to have this mock. I knew it. I knew this was coming. This wasn't a surprise to me. I had done my research best I could on the smile on what I could expect in this training. I knew a mock was coming. So I tried to prepare. I really did. And I had a stack of paper in preparation. I was studying everything. I knew how many agents we had in this particular zone. I knew what their operated cost was. I knew what their um, uh, their loss ratios were for multiple lines of insurance. I, I had stats and facts and figures stuffed into my head that I did days and days in advance of this. Studied it all the way on the plane down there. There wasn't a question technically that he could ask me that I wasn't able to 
provide an answer to. So when we were uh, going through that mock, he saw my stack of, of paper. And he asked me, what's that, Mark? And I said, what's well, my prep? That's my prep. And he, and he did this, and I want you to recall, uh, remember this. He took my stack, and he, he did this during my mock. So my self-reflective voice was, damn, what the hell? <laughs> right? And he said this to me, and I want you to remember this. This is another nugget for you. He says, Mark, this interview is not about do you have the qualifications for the job. That's not what this is. That decision has already been made. That's already been made. That's quite literally off the table. When you have an interview, they've already seen your resume. They know you have the baseline competencies and goals, education, to do their job. That's not what this interview is about. This is about, do I like you? Will you be a good fit? And he was sharing this. I didn't believe it, but he was sharing it. I now subscribe to it, obviously, as probably one of his largest supporters because I see it day in and day out. It's not about, I have to sell, 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 and I have the ability to do the job. Done, that's the name. Now it's about, do I like you? Will you be a good fit? And the decision in that regard is made very quickly. Arguably, in the introduction, or very early in the introduction. Now, I told you I've interviewed a lot of people, and I told you the bar really isn't that high, because many people don't interview well. You know, it's, what I've discovered is people who are um, braggarts <coughs> interview pretty well. Now, they like talking about themselves, right? They just enjoy talking about themselves. They're very good, they're very comfortable at that. Now, the bad thing is no one likes a bragging. But in an interview, you have to have some of that. You've got to get to that point where you're comfortable in talking about yourself. You've got to get to that point. Now, I don't want you to be a bragger outside of the interview process, but in the interview process, I want you to be able to do that. And I want you to have this introduction. They're going to ask you, thanks for coming in. I've seen your resume. I'm very impressed. 3.2 out of the Montfort College of Business, finance major. It's awesome. Why don't you start off the interview by telling me a little bit about yourself, right? I get this with great frequency. Oh. Well, what do you want to know? So not, it's a very bad way to start. One is there's nothing up there. And two, again, I've, I've lost this connection. You're not looking at me. I don't have that eye contact. You're asking me a question of, of a question I just asked you. I just simply wanted to know about yourself. And you're surprised by that? Now, I used to call this, um, this presentation something else. It, it, it had to do with um, how to avoid um, kayaking or something. We, we leave kayaking in there because during this type of situation, uh, I find myself drifting off in my head and I enjoy kayaking, uh, ocean kayaking, and I just kayak away. Now, it looks like I'm looking at you, but I'm kayaking away. And when someone does this, oh, what do you want to know? I'm kayaking. I'm already kayaking. Because I'm done that fast. I'm not seeing the passion. I'm not seeing the enthusiasm. I don't have this human connection with you. And quite honestly, if I have to tell you what to tell me, I'm not going to consider you. It's not a good way to start. So you know this question is coming. I want a very passionate, if you're rally scripted, yes, shouldn't come across can response to it. I'd love to tell you about myself. I want that passion. And then you're gonna have, you're gonna tell them a little bit about yourself. And I, when I say tell them a little bit about yourself, I get a question on that with some frequency. 
I don't want you just to say what's on your resume. Oh, my name is Mark Neville. I went to Long Beach uh, State. I graduated again this year. Um, I am part of this fraternity. I, you're just reading your resume to me. I already know that. I asked, who were you? Tell me a little bit about yourself. This is your time to make that human connection. Give them some information. I would love to tell you about myself. Well, I'm a transplant here to Colorado. I moved out here and blah, blah, blah. You know, some of the things I do on the weekend, I enjoy hiking. Right now, I'm trying to do one 14er every year. That's my new goal. And I just did Long's Peak last year. This year, I'm going to do this. The, I enjoy fishing, um, uh, fly fishing specifically. Matter of fact, I bought about $1,000 worth of equipment, and I caught three fish. It's kind of an expensive sport. Right? So I'm sure, does that have anything to do with the job? No! But are they going to laugh like that? Yes. They're going to they're gonna like, guess what they're going to do? I like him. I like him. He shared some things about himself. He opened up. He talked about what his passions were. He gave me some information that I didn't already know. I like him. That's what I want. Your goal is to get them to say, when the door shuts behind you, I like him. I like her. That's your goal. And to do that, you have to share. Now, you can overshare. I don't want you to go in and say, well, <coughs> last week I had this boil lanced here, and did you want to see it? <laughs> no. I, I mean, obviously, you've got to understand where that line of appropriateness is. But many people go way short of giving any information that would give you some insight to who that person is, what their passions are. That's what I want from you. That's what I want from you. So I want you to forecast and script this in your head. It's going to come across different every time. I'm okay with that. The intent is I'm going to share some information and leave that person with, I like them. I like them. And you're going to do it with this great eye contact. There's no reason for you to ever lose eye contact with the person who is interviewing you or the panel. Now, if it's a panel, one person asks you a question, you have to make sure all the people in the panel feel engaged. So you're going to scan everyone. It's not his question. It's everyone's question. You have to understand that. So you have to make sure everyone is in this conversation and they feel engaged. I want a smile. I don't know why it's so hard for people. I, I, I am not lying when I say so many people inter, interview, they walk out and I say, did they have teeth? Do you think they have teeth? Because I never see the hint of a smile. And the reason is, they're so nervous. They're so nervous that they, they can't show that. And they're so nervous that they can't create that human connection. Because nerves prevent it. Nerves prevent them from maintaining that eye contact. Nerves preventing them from smiling. Nerves preventing them from using that passion in their voice. And that's what we want. We want someone who wants the company. I ask this question with almost every interview. Why do you want to work here? Yellow shirt, what's your name? Paul, why do you want to work here? And Paul says to me, oh, I don't know. Um, my parents have State Farm. I get that. With some, and that doesn't endear me to hiring you. I want you to want me. And I want something like this. Well, Mark, let me tell you. Right? Paul used my name. Right? I'm just like Sarah. People like hearing their name. And it's a skill. And I want you to use that in the interview. Paul says, Mark, let me tell you why. I've got several people that I know, relationship building, that work at State Farm. And I really feel I understand your culture. I understand that you're very high on self-development and education, and that you're a very moral company, and that some of the skill sets that are required for this particular job are attention to detail, the ability to work as a team, the ability to communicate both in written and oral form. 
those are kind of skill sets I'm confident that I'm bringing to the table here. I'm just, he's got me, he owns me. I'm, I'm laughing it up. <laughs> right? I almost never hear that. Almost never. And I don't understand it. In today's age, when you can research everything electronically, there's no reason for it. You should know about this organization for which you can do it. I want you to know about it. Now, now, this is my own personal thing. I want you to pursue an occupation for which you're truly excited, that you're passionate about. Because uh, people have good BS detectors. And if you're trying to say you're passionate about this organization and you're not, they'll sniff it out. And I don't want you to do that. I want you to find a company that you're like, oh man, yes, that's who I want to work for, and this is why. And I want you to tell them. If they don't ask you, I want you to tell them. Because HR, or the hiring manager, wants the person who wants the job because they know something about us. They're not just saying, I just need a job. I think student loans do. That's not what we're looking for. <laughs> We want people who really want us, and they've, they've done their research, and they've done their homework, and now they're coming to us because they're confident there's a match there. That they're going to be successful, they're going to enjoy their work, and we're going to benefit from their skills and knowledge. So it's this win-win, and that's what we're looking for. We want that. Now, how do, you, how do you go through this? How do you make this introduction so that you knock their socks off this Passion, this enthusiasm, the smile, the eye contact. How do you do it? This nice, let me tell you about me. I'd love to tell you about myself. Thank you for asking. And, and going through this maybe three minute long introduction about yourself. One, as I discovered, you, many people, including myself, you've got to get rid of the word interview. Because as soon as you hear interview, you get puckered up. Right? You do a mark of, uh, maybe here's State Farm, or, and you become this. this detached robot that is not making a human connection. So get rid of it. Because <coughs> really what this is, it's a conversation. And you need to just replace that word, interview with this conversation, with the goal of getting them to like you. Get them to like you. Hey, this was years ago, but it was Dr. McClatchy's class, and someone in the back said, Mark, can I use these skills to pick up chips? <laughs> yes. Yes! Right? Yes! I hope no one's offended by that. It was his quote, I'm just saying. But, yes! It's a human connection. It's about likability. And I want you to think back, and, and, and I want you to start looking at some of these skill sets I'm talking about. Because it's when I talk this self-presentation, I mean it's not about interviewing, although it has tremendous application to interviewing. It's about your self-presentation. So next time you're at some social event or party and you meet someone for the first time, I'm like, Paul, hey, it's great to meet you. And I look Paul in the eyes and I'm smiling at Paul. I have this warm tone and I go, you're in this fraternity and I saw you guys both. And I talk to him real quick and we part. Paul's going to go, I like him. And if Paul reciprocates with that smile, warm tone, great eye contact, I'm going to say the same thing about him. I like Paul. I like them. It's very quick. It happens very quick. There's all kinds of books out. The link comes to mind um, about how fast we as humans evaluate one another. Uh, and at times, uh, Dr. Clatch and I have done this, this talk, and I come out very stoic. And I'm like, thank you uh, for your attendance. I'm sure I'm more excited than you are. Right? I go through this because I know you're making this determination about me so fast. And then after I do that, I step back and I say, what? I would imagine if I were you, I'd be like, oh my god, I'm not going to get this hour and 15 minutes of my life back. This is going to be brutal. Because you're making this determination about me, and many times, you're right, so quick. And you're, and you're reading everything I'm doing tremendously non-verbally. How I'm, how I'm approaching this from a posture standpoint, as well as my tonality, my voice. Uh, and when I do that, I would imagine uh, you're thinking, oh, this is going to be 
further. Mm -hmm. and, and if that's true, who I was, you'd probably be right. So think about it when you have these interactions. Now I'll even go to the point where on the phone, you know what you have on the other end of the phone very, very quickly. At State Farm, we have a lot of people who are in call centers, and just having this interest in this self-presentation, I asked them, uh, an entire team, how fast do you think you're making a determination on what you have on the other end of the line? And they talked about it, and it, it came back as a group, eight seconds. Eight seconds. And I said, I, I agree with that. And the vast majority of the time, they're right. Now, they don't have any, um, they don't have any visual cues. All they have is tonality, rate, and volume. And I want to make sure you understand how important that is. Smiley was right. When I did this, Mark and I would go up, he, and he didn't like me, he was right. You've got to use this warm, enthusiastic, passionate tone. Great eye contact. Never look <coughs> Okay, I spent an enormous amount of time on this introduction, and it wasn't by mistake. I want you to understand how important this is. Now, there's other pieces to this interview, clearly. There's other components to an interview, and I'm going to go through those relatively quickly, because I'm not nearly as concerned about those components as I am the introduction, and your understanding of how important it is to make a human connection. Because if you can make that human connection in the introduction, the interview progresses completely differently. They're relaxed, Paul's laughing, and suddenly, this is truly a conversation, and the self-reflective voice is gone. And the whole interview is different than if you had a poor introduction, and the person's just kayaking away. Many of the uh, larger organizations use competency-based questions. Competency-based. Competency-based means your past performance is the best predictor of what you're going to do in the future, you're going to hear a question like this. Paul, tell me about a time that you demonstrated remarkable customer service. Very common question. Doesn't have anything to do with the finance. They're just looking to see, does Paul get it with customer service? Does he get it? So how do you answer that kind of thing? Not with philosophy. <coughs> it is simple once you hear it. Competency-based gets answered with, and there's all kinds of different models, but it's story. What did you do? Results. Or story, action, results, the SAR model, S-A-R. So I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of what that means. Paul asked me, Mark, hey, thanks for coming in. Went through the introduction, blah, blah, blah. He finally said, Mark, tell me about a time that you did, uh, you know, demonstrated remarkable customer service. And I would say, well, Paul, that's um, using his name. I think I have an, uh, an answer to that. And, and while I was going to UNC, I worked at Wendy's uh, at night. And Wendy's is open late. We're open until 2 in the morning. And this is going back maybe hmm, three weeks ago, maybe a month now. And I was working at night, and it was probably close to 1 o'clock uh, in the evening. And it was dark. And, and through our lobby windows, I could see that we were having a customer. So I could see the car pull. So I was preparing my workstation in advance of the customer. And sure enough, a couple minutes later, the, our, our uh, door opens up, um, and this woman takes a few steps in. Well, maybe five minutes before that, I had just mopped our tile floor, and I had put down those yellow caution wet floor. And as she walked through that area, she slipped, and she fell hard. So I ran out from my register, and I assisted her up, and I said, ma'am, are you okay? And she was more embarrassed than anything else, and she says, oh, my God, I'm, I'm fine, I, I'll be fine. So as I'm walking back to my register, I'm thinking to myself, geez, here's, here we have a customer coming to patronize Wendy's at, at one in the morning, she has this terrible experience. So I, I made the decision that I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna comp her meal. So she ordered, and then she approached and ordered, I said, ma'am, are you okay, sure? And <laughs> I don't think she wanted to even talk about it again. She assured me she was, took her order, and I told her, ma'am, I'm so sorry for your experience, please accept this on behalf of Wendy's tonight. And she did, and she left. The next day, I told my manager about it, and, and he was fine. Um, but about a week after that, my manager called me back in and said, Mark, do you remember the, 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 the customer who slipped last week? And I said, oh, yeah, I sure did. And in the back of my head, I was thinking, uh-oh, what happened? 
And he says, no, she came in to visit me and asked for the manager specifically and said how, how valued she felt as a customer and how appreciative she was about your, your caring response and the fact that she comped her meal was just icing on the cake. And before she left, she told my manager, Wendy's has a customer for life. And I felt really good about that. Done. Let me talk about what I did. I didn't cure cancer, right? It wasn't this huge thing. I didn't save a million dollars. I just answered that question. It's a customer service question. And I told a story, right? If I did it right, you saw my lady who slept. You saw her. I didn't tell you much about her. I didn't give you her hair color. I didn't give you what she was wearing. But you saw her if I did it right. You were into my story because I gave you enough of the information to do that. I told you about the tile floor. I told you about my little yellow comb. You saw this. You saw my register. You saw it all because I took the time to tell you my story. I want you to be able to do that. I then said, what did I do? I comped her meal. I asked her if she was okay. Story, what did you do, or action, and then result. The result was I, or Wendy's, has a customer for life. How do you know? Because I told you. I took the time to tell you. If you hit those three elements in a competency-based question, you're gonna answer everything they wanna know. If you miss one of those, you're gonna get a response. You're gonna say, well, what happened to her? Right, because you didn't tell them that, or what did you do? Or finally, well, whatever happened to her? The results. You're gonna get a question like that. If you get a question like that, you're missing one of the three elements. Now, if you get another question like, ah, I worked at McDonald's, I hear what you're saying, but maybe you just got interest. Yeah, you just got, you got that eating out of your, like your palm of your hand. So that's, I want to answer a competency base. Now, I get this question quite a bit. Um, Mark? There are so many competencies, I can't prepare for them all. I can't. There's gotta be, off the top of my head, I can probably think of 50. Customer service being one, initiative, decision making, teamwork, right? I mean, there you can go on and on about all these competencies. How could I prepare for them all? I don't want you to. I don't want you, you can't. People at State Farm try to do that, and they fail miserably because they don't have a good story an action result for every competency out there that just matches perfect. So I want you to think about this Wendy story. And Paul asks me, hey Mark, tell me about the time that you had to make a decision. That's what I can use. I can use that same story. Mark, tell me about that time you took initiative. Oh, same story. Right now I'm not going to say the same story over and over again. My point is, I want you to have five stories. Five. And I want you to look at them as having different skill sets. You know, one might be a leadership one, might, one might be um, uh, teamwork, one might be decision making. But I want you to come up with five that all have a nice story. What do you do in a result? And then when you get the question, you can just pick from that quiver of five the one that meets that question best. And you may have to customize it slightly to best meet that interviewer's objectives. But it works tremendous. And guess what? It takes a lot of stress off you. A lot of stress. Because people just become a mess when they try to come up with something for every conference. And I don't want you to do that. Does that make sense? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna move on. You're going to get, I, I still see it being the flavor of the month, and it's been going on for a couple of years, a negative question. A negative question uh, throws people off because you've prepared positive, positive, positive. All your stories that you're probably thinking, positive, positive, positive. And then they ask you, Paul, tell me about a time that you were unable to meet a stated deadline. Paul's like, all the way. And he throws out something like this. Well, I got a lot of those, right? Uh, that's a fatal flaw. I don't want that. <laughs> Answer negative, and there's a lot of negatives out there. Tell me about a time you, you know, couldn't get along with a coworker. Tell me about a time that um, that you missed a stated objective. Tell me about a time that you a lot of 
So I want to, I want to talk about it and answer those real quick. It's the same. It's the same model. It's situation when you do result with a couple slight tweaks. Right off the bat, I want you to cut it off at the knee. So I want Paul. If I ask Paul that, I want Paul to say, "Well, Mark, I struggle with that because one of my strengths is truly attention to detail and my timeliness." Right. So now I'm not thinking Paul's Paul's a slacker and that this is going to be a consistent issue or problem. He's already cut it off at the knees, but I have a situation that I believe answers your question. So he's cut it off at the knees, and now he's going to go into his, his story. And I want you to be prepared to talk about a failure with a story. It's okay. There's, as I always say, with the exception of Dr. McClatchy, there's none of us here that are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so think about a story. Now, you can obviously tell a story, and you can say what you did, in other words, how you failed. What's the result? How's the result on a negative? The result is I learned something. Let me tell you what I learned from that story. And then you tell me. And that's the result. And this is how I'm going to ensure that it never happens again. That, that's how you're going to answer a negative. Okay. Now, we've gone through the introduction, spent an enormous amount of time, rightfully so, talked about quickly how to answer a competency-based question. Um, I'm going to tell you just because they're so fun, and i got a million of them, that uh, you know, some of these people come in and interview, and I still remember this, this one individual. Uh, he came in, and uh, I was screaming on myself, and I asked him just that question that I asked Paul. Tell me about a time that you provided remarkable customer service. And the reason I was interviewing this person was he was he just retired from the military, and I appreciate his service, and I'm looking to hire those individuals because I want to thank them, and I want to keep them employed. Uh, so I, he, you know, he was older, uh, being retired from the military, and I was interviewing him, and I asked him the customer service question. He said, "Well, um, when I got out of the military, I was working at a cleaners here in town, and this lady came in." And I'll use his words. She was chewing my ass. Not the best thing to do in an interview. Just use profanity. It's just a little tip. He says, I wanted to jump over the counter and stick my foot up her. He says, but Mark, I didn't. <laughs> environment I'm in, from his environment, from a military perspective, that was okay. I mean, was, his, his use of profanity wouldn't have raised alarms, his use of physical violence to another wouldn't have raised too much, but from my very uh, uh, clean uh, environment, <coughs> sterile environment, uh, it would have been a disaster for me to, to hire. So, anyway, there's a, there's a lot of people that, that interview very poorly. Uh, and as I said, you work on this, this is going to, to help you quite a bit. There's one area that we haven't talked about, and this is, we talked introduction, we talked about body. Body meaning this is where the questions are. And then finally, what I call uh, the dismount. The dismount's the ending of your interview. Um, and you know what's coming. You're going to get something like, hey, Paul, I appreciate you coming in and spending time with me today. Do you have any questions for me? Or is there anything you want to leave me with? That's your cue that this bad boy's wrapping up. And they're always, almost always, have that sort of signal to you, that you know that this is coming to a conclusion. And many times I get, Mark, you know, I just thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Is it awful? No, but it's missing the mark. And this is why I want, I call it the dismount, because again, I, I'm trying to either tell you stories or do things that you remember. And right now we're in the Winter Olympics. This kind of has a, a tie to this, the Summer Olympics, uh, this dismount. And I want you to picture this gymnastics routine. As I'm always amazed at it, and I do love watching it. I love watching the Olympics, uh, even the Winter Olympics. Gene and I were just talking about that. But so Summer Olympics, gymnastics, and we can say it's the uneven bars. And if you ever watch that, you realize there's judges from across the world that are all electronically judging these athletes. Right? Okay, release skill, check it, got the nice strength skill. You know, they're going through all this. But in this high level of competition, 
high, super high level, Olympic level competition, it amazes me that it comes down to this, right? The person comes off the ending bars and they do this. Oh! Oh! Oh no! He took a step! He took a high oh, point deduction, blah, blah, blah. Lost the goal, right? You're like, right, he was on that for five minutes, it was phenomenal. It came down to that little step. Yeah. High level of competition. I want you to think of the ending of your interview very similar. If I had two candidates neck and neck, both incredible, great interview, passion, enthusiasm, I like them both. The person who nails that dismount, that could be the differentiator. So how do you do it? Well, if I ask you, hey, do you have any questions for me, Paul? Is there anything you want to leave me with? I want you to respond to that. So many times I tell people, don't ask a question if you could have gotten the answer to it outside of that interview. In other words, it's a stupid question from my perspective. <coughs> I want you to know about my job. So I don't want you to ask me a question, again, that you could have obtained on the internet or somewhere else um, easily. It just looks like you're not prepared. Like, Mark, what can I expect the starting salary to be? One, at least, kind of, that's all you want is money. Secondly, you don't know that, and you're here. It kind of, it just, it, it hurts you more than helps you. So don't think you're doing a favor by asking a, a question like that. I'd rather you do something like this. You know, Paul, I don't have any questions, but I want to thank you for your time. But let me address that. The reason I don't have any questions is because I've done my homework on this organization well in advance of this interview. I wouldn't be in front of you today unless I was sure that my skills will enable me to be highly successful in this organization and specifically in this position. You know, I've got a number of friends that work here and I've done a lot of research and from my perspective, the skills that are absolutely essential for this position are, and I'm gonna tell them, customer service, my ability to communicate, my ability to take initiative my ability to blah, 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 blah. Paul, those are the skills that I bring to you today. Those are the skills, quite frankly, Paul, that I'm convinced will ensure my success. You know, I want to thank you for your time again, and I look forward to hearing from you. I want that. I want something like that. Now, it's customized. I want you to come up with it. I want you to, to truly do the research and sell your skills. Remember I told you? It's, there's a... A time to be humble, and that's great, but the interview isn't the time. You need to sell your skills. You need to be likable and be able to sell your skills. Understand the skills that are necessary and match them to the position. And this dismount is a great way to do it. Was it long? No. But it's passionate. It shows my enthusiasm. It shows my knowledge. It shows my uh, ability to to match my own skill sets that I've acquired with the skills that are acquired, and leaves that interviewer with a great taste of you in their mouth as you walk out the door. Okay, I've used every bit of my time, and I um, realize there's, there's many times there's questions that you have, and we're going to be meeting if, if you'd like. We've got a reception plan for those of you who have questions or would like to talk further with uh, Mark over in room 265, special projects room, the second door down as you go out uh, on the left. And uh, we welcome you to come over and get your If I can leave you just with one thing, thank you for your attendance. Uh, I enjoy this. Good luck to you. If you don't have time to come, I'm okay with that, but uh, good luck. Try to think about the things I talked about today, and I'm sure uh, your interview process will go much better. Thank you very much.